Would you all join me in an attitude of prayer? God, Creator of all things, we come before you to praise your name and to stand on the rock that is Jesus Christ. We come before you in this time of worship and praise so that we can come to know you more. So that we can come to learn about ourselves more. God, we pray that you send your Holy Spirit down into this place. Let it set a wildfire in our hearts, in our minds, and in our souls. Let us feel your passion and your power this day and every day. And God, I, I speak and ask that the words that I speak this morning not be my own, but may they be yours, O God, because you are the one we have come to praise. You are the one we have come to worship. Fill us with your teachings this day and lead us the way that you would have us to go so that when we go out these doors into the world, we are your servants and we are being Christ to the world. All of this we lift up in Jesus' name. Amen. So the sermon title uh, this morning is Thomas Gets a Bad Rap. Let's go into the word, shall we? On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. I want you to picture in your mind this story. In the darkness of that first day of the week, Mary, Peter, and the beloved disciple did not know what had happened. Had the body of their teacher and friend been stolen? It began a day that would be filled with an empty tomb, heavenly messengers, and the news that the man that they had watched hanging on a cross, the man whose dead body they had laid in a tomb, was now walking and talking to Mary. How could they make sense of what had happened to Jesus? To them. Now we find them again in the dark. These are the people who heard the news from Peter that the tomb was empty. These are the friends and followers of Jesus to whom Mary brought the message that she had met the risen Christ. She gave them Jesus' message. But what are they doing on this night? They don't seem to be celebrating. They have locked the door for fear that the same thing that had happened to Jesus was going to happen to them. Into that locked room, Jesus appears. Into that moment of fear and surprise, Jesus comes with a message of comfort. Peace be with you. In fact, he offers that message to them twice. First, when they see this figure suddenly appear before them, and then he repeats this message once again after they've seen his wounds and realize that they like Mary before them, have finally met the risen Christ. It is at this time that Jesus breathed on them and imparted on them the Holy Spirit. We quickly remember, and it comes to mind, how God has done this before in Scripture. We find this in Genesis chapter 1, when God breathed, spoke creation into existence. And in chapter 2, where God breathed life into Adam and Eve, and brought them into existence. We also see this again in Ezekiel, where the prophet spoke of God going to resurrect the children of God, who had gone on before them and breathed new life into them again, those dry bones becoming whole again. Jesus then leaves, and Thomas comes back from wherever he was, and I imagine does the secret knock on the door, only to enter and hear the same line that they had all heard that morning from Mary Magdalene. We have seen the Lord. Thomas demands to see Jesus for himself. And we find ourselves a week later still in the same room with the door closed and locked. And when Jesus returns and greets them with, Peace be with you. 
Jesus then shows Thomas his wounds, to which Thomas replies, My Lord and my God. So I want to begin by asking you all a question. And I do encourage you all to participate and give me some answers. Where is the best place to get a crab cake? Here. I, I know I knew JR was going to say Chesapeake Landing. Any others? Okay. We've, she probably does make them. All right. Are there, uh, so, are there any other different opinions? I heard three, so we'll go with those. So how about another question? Where can I go to get the best ice cream in town? So we've got two different opinions there. <laughs> eh, Oxford's close enough. We'll give it to you. Chick-fil-A. Okay. How about the best place to go and fish? Where's the best fishing hole? I like the way I like the way you think. <laughs> and better yet, where is the best place to watch the sunset this time of year? That was a definitive answer right there. Yep. You see, in the end, it's all about personal experience. And at times, your experience will be different from someone else's. But then, when you are asked by someone who has never experienced what you have, you want to encourage them and have the same experience for themselves. Maybe you have had this experience. One of your friends comes to you after seeing a movie or going to a concert or visiting a beautiful place and saying, you have got to see this. You listen with interest, even as you're trying to distinguish between the hype and what is real. And it's not exactly right to say that you don't believe the testimony of your friends. It's more like you don't have the experience of your own to compare to theirs. You don't know you've had a good sunset at your house, but supposedly the best sunsets at Aubrey's house, you know. To know what you believe about what they are reporting, you will have to go to that movie or go try that concert or to see the sunset in that particular spot. In order to offer your own testimony, you need to have your own experience. You see, this is where we are in Scripture this morning. Thomas wants to be able to have his own experience. Because of that, Thomas often gets a bad rap for being the disciple who doubted. But I think that it's interesting because just moments before Thomas came into the room, the other disciples were in a very similar situation. Here we are after the death of Christ, and just this morning Mary Magdalene had come back from the tomb saying that she had seen Jesus and he had given her a message to tell everybody else. But here it is that evening of the same day, and where are the disciples? Hiding in fear in a locked room. Scripture does not say whether or not the disciples believed Mary, but we can safely assume by that locked door that they weren't really sure Mary was telling the truth because it was not their experience to see Jesus alive and walking after they had just seen him crucified. But then they have an amazing experience where Jesus comes in and brings peace by showing them his hands and his side. Thomas comes back and we find him in the same position of all the disciples had just been moments ago. He wanted proof and wanted to see Jesus where his wounds were so that he could know it was actually Jesus. I think it's important to address that he was not in the locked room when Jesus came the first time. So, a common question is, where was Thomas when Jesus shows up for the first time? Scripture does not tell us, but we do have some sources that might help shine some light on this. Because Josephus and other writers in the first century 
made a couple of reports as to where Thomas was at the time. One report suggested that he was on a supply run to help get the disciples who were get supplies for the disciples who were trying to hide. Another report suggested multiple accounts of serving the community and confidently proclaiming his faith in Jesus and the work that Jesus had done before. Just going off of these possibilities, if I were Thomas, I would be upset as well. It is very possible that Thomas was already doing the work that Jesus had called the disciples to do, even though the rest of them were not doing what Jesus had asked them, as they were too afraid and remained locked in that room. And here, Jesus supposedly shows up to the disciples who did nothing. Thomas was not going to have it. Either he would have his own experience with the resurrected Christ, or he was not going to believe what the disciples were telling him. The tomb was empty, and so everyone wanted to have their own experience with Jesus, like Mary had in the garden that morning. A week later, Jesus shows up with the same greeting of peace, but then he directs his focus to Thomas. <clears throat> he invites Thomas to see and touch his wounds, and Thomas believes before he even begins to touch Jesus. My Lord and my God. So when we read that Thomas refuses to believe in the resurrection based on more hearsay, when we hear again his demand for physical proof, we come to the text with two differing thoughts. Our proper, church-going, religious selves want to wag our finger at Thomas. Shame on you. And you call yourself an apostle? How could you have doubt? But another part of us is happy to hear Thomas say, unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in, the ha in my hand in his side, I will not believe. If it's true, and I'm not saying that it's not true, but if it is true, we can't, why can't we get our own proof? We want to see. We want to touch. We want to experience it for ourselves. If only we had been there when Peter empty, entered the tomb and found it empty, except for what? The linen head wrappings neatly folded and laid aside. If only we had felt our own hearts ignited by the words of the stranger on that road to Emmaus. If only Jesus had been revealed to us that evening in the breaking of the bread or on the road to Damascus. I think we would prefer that experience to no proof at all. We might gladly change places with Saul and endure losing our sight, separated from the only life we've ever known, because we would gladly endure it, because then at long last, we would be sure it was Jesus. Or even just to be a face in the crowd, one of the anonymous onlookers to when Jesus appeared to the multitudes throughout his ministry. In short, we understand Thomas perfectly, don't we? We too want to be there. We want proof for ourselves. As a, a part of us cheers him on when he sets his terms for belief. Not unless I see, not unless I touch. Thank you for speaking on our behalf, Thomas. We find ourselves this morning wanting the same thing, an experience with God. We want that proof to know without a shadow of a doubt that our faith is in something that is not just a myth or a fairy tale. The disadvantage that we have is that we weren't around in first century Israel. And time travel to go back and witness it is still not possible. But what we do have is Scripture. We literally have a new testament to what God is doing in the world and God's desire to be in a relationship with us. We find that relationship is being formed because of our faith in God. Just as Christ breathed the Holy Spirit into the early disciples, we too have the Holy Spirit with us every minute of every hour of every day. And God is willing to breathe the Spirit into us to make us a new resurrected creation. God wants to show up for us too. As we experience the story of Thomas, we are invited to trust that Jesus will keep showing up 
alive and with a body that holds together the worst that has happened to him and his risen life. He is eager to reveal himself not only through appearances, but also through the written word. Again and again, he will offer that wounded living body to us until finally the whole of creation will live in the peace he offers when he makes himself known. Amen and amen. I now invite everyone